Hello and welcome to Edgecast, the series where we show you tips, tricks and best practices when using Solid Edge. Although, in this episode, we'll mostly be looking beyond Solid Edge to a rendering application that comes with it. Some of you may have heard of it, but for those who aren't already familiar, welcome to Keyshot. Today, I'll be showing you the basics of how to edit a scene in Keyshot, but first, I'll be explaining what it is, who can access it, and why I'm talking about it. Then I'll show a basic introduction to the environment, how to add materials, lights, cameras, and then render your first images. Finally, I'll leave you with some tips specifically for those who use Keyshot embedded with Solid Edge. So, without any further ado, let's ask the obvious question, which is, what is Keyshot, and what does it do? Keyshot is a rendering software, meaning that it takes 3D models and creates realistic images from them. An interesting feature of this software, though, is that Keyshot doesn't need a graphics card built into your workstation. It creates these renders with ray tracing technology, which I'll touch on later in the video. I'll be using Keyshot 7.3, because this is the version that's installed by default with Solid Edge 2019, if you have classic or premium licenses. If you're using Foundation or Design and Draft, it's still available, but has to be bought separately. So, if you don't have Keyshot, sorry to disappoint you in this video, I'll make up for it with something special next time. So, how do we use Keyshot? To start off with, you need to import 3D geometry, and then assign materials to the different parts. Then set up a lighting environment and background, add some cameras and tweak their view settings, define your render settings, and hit the big render button to create your images, whether they're for a design portfolio, company marketing material, or just to take home and show your family. It's not for me to say. Here's how you get to Keyshot. In Solid Edge, make sure you have a 3D model open. Then, under the Tools tab, start Keyshot Render. And here we are in Keyshot. Now, if you're starting Keyshot 7 for the first time, you might see a blank screen. If so, it's because you have the Startup workspace active. For now, you may want to toggle over to Default, and then Keyshot will start up with all of these panes and windows active. The libraries for materials, environments, etc. can be found on the left by default, and your project settings can be found in the Project tab on the right. You might notice that view controls are a bit different to Solid Edge. My scroll wheel still zooms in and out as normal, but by default left click and drag will revolve or tumble the model present, and middle mouse and drag will pan the camera instead of revolving the view. Keyshot does have some modeling capabilities which are independent of Solid Edge, but they're limited. Using the Move tool allows either the entire model or certain components to be moved around the render environment. Now, none of these changes make any difference to the Solid Edge model, as Keyshot uses its own geometry, saved in a file with the extension .bip or bip. I can also clone this geometry by using import and choosing the bit file I already have open. If necessary, a whole environment of different products can be assembled this way, although it's not an accurate assembly tool. It's meant to create artistic images, not engineering drawings. Once your geometry is in place, you could just generate a render. However, this means skipping out one of the most useful tools in Keyshot, creating detailed materials for your scene. You can assign materials from the inbuilt Keyshot library from the Library tab on the left, and create and edit materials in your environment with the Project tab, Materials section. If you change part material in Solid Edge, just bear in mind that pressing Keyshot Update is going to override the material you have in Keyshot with a new one from Solid Edge. There are ways to prevent this with material template rules, but I don't think we'll have time to look into them today. I'll start off by dragging and dropping a material onto this oil filter assembly. Stainless steel of some kind, I think. Radially brushed? I think not. Brushed fine? Much better. What other kinds of steel do I have? Let's search for any material in my library with steel in the name. And now I think it's time for some rough steel for this valve body right here. For all the pipes, brass looks like it'll be a good fit. So let's use rough brass for these two. This message pops up because I've used the same material on more than one part, and Keyshot's offering to link them together. 
I'm going to click yes, which means that if I replace or edit the material for one of these parts, it'll do the same for the parts that also have linked materials. You'll also see that the model details are going to change in the project pane on the right. I'm almost done with this scene. I just need to add some materials to the nuts. I'm not sure what material the red nut is made of, but I'll just choose one that looks good. And there we go. I know I missed two parts out, but this is just a demo. So let's say I have my materials, but one of them doesn't quite look right. I want this tank to look darker and rougher, not light and shiny like this. In the project tab, I can edit the material. Stainless steel brushed is the one I want to change. Let's start by changing the colour of the metal to a darker grey, and now we'll make it look rougher. In the textures section of the material tab, we have these three boxes up here, colour, bump and opacity. These are what's known as maps, or image files that can be applied to a material. The colour map makes a coloured image project onto the surface of the part which has this material applied, but that alone isn't enough to make something look rougher. Instead, we'll need an addition of bump maps. Bump maps force light to bounce off the material in a way that makes the surface appear rough, and matching bump and colour maps makes for a realistic rough surface. Although I should probably have used a better image for my map. This one isn't very good quality. Now for a bit of tweaking of these materials. I'll rotate the map by 90 degrees to make the surface roughness appear vertically, and reduce the bump height to make the roughness a little less extreme. That kind of thing. The Save button lets you save your custom materials back to the Keyshot library, but if you want to see what the Keyshot community have to offer, try the Cloud library. Just be aware that you have to create an online account before you can download any of these resources, but as you can see, there are some pretty creative things people have made for others to use. Lighting is extremely important in Keyshot. You can have all the pretty materials in the world, but if they're not lit well, they'll just appear dull. You have two kinds of lighting. Environment lighting, which comes from the surroundings, and light materials, which allow a piece of geometry in the scene to act as a light source. My advice would be to try dragging in a basic keyshot environment from the library on the left, and then tweaking it with your environment section on the project tab on the right. If needs be, you can add physical lights afterwards, which I'll demonstrate in a minute. Before that, I'm going to bring up something that people often forget. Don't forget to save your cameras. In the Project tab, you can place as many cameras as you want, and then delete them if they become unnecessary. Their position and orientation can be either governed precisely, or you can use your mouse to orient the render window as you need. In addition, lens settings are designed to reflect settings that would apply for a real-life camera, such as focal length and field of view. As an example, let's zoom in on this section of the oil filter assembly. I want to place a camera here, so let's go to the Camera Project section and save the current camera. And then rename it with right-click and rename. If I could spell detail, then that would be useful. There we go. If I then lock the camera, I can't alter its view position or any of the lens settings, I'll need to activate my free camera if I want to move around, which can't be locked. However, if I activate this locked camera again by left-clicking, it snaps back to the original orientation. Unlocking means that I can change settings, so let's turn on depth of field. I'll explain what depth of field does in the next section. The point I'm trying to make is that you can save these settings per camera, not as a global setting necessarily. So always remember everyone, save your cameras. Once you've finished setting up the scene and you've positioned a camera, or lots of cameras, it's time to render. I like using Control p to bring up this render menu, where you can fine-tune the quality of the image being created. Now some might be greyed out, for example, depth of field must be enabled in the Project tab under the Camera section for it to be available here, and some of you might be wondering what some of these options do. As it's not obvious what, for example, increasing the number of samples does, I'll explain what the most significant of these options do, but I won't go into every option here. Let's start with the most important. Most digital screens show images with a series of small squares called pixels, and resolution 
is a way of explaining how detailed the image is, with two numbers, number of horizontal pixels and number of vertical pixels. For example, this picture here is a 2x2 image, because it only has two vertical and two horizontal pixels. Most computer screens display in higher resolutions than that, say 1920x1080 is a common resolution, so I often use this when rendering. Low resolution images are created quickly, but they often appear blurry, especially when you zoom in on them. High resolution, on the other hand, means that you spend much longer rendering, because there are more pixels, but the images, generally speaking, look better. Here's a comparison to show what changing resolution can do to an image. As you can see, here's an image on the right which looks much sharper. I didn't change anything else, I just changed the resolution. Next, anti-aliasing. It's probably possible to write a book on the different ways that you can add anti-aliasing, but basically, it's not possible to show a truly smooth angled line on a computer screen because the pixels are square and arranged vertically. That means you get jagged edges. However, if you apply anti-aliasing, then they appear smoother. How does it work? Well, it looks at the pixels right next to a sharp edge on the image, and then, by creating average RGB values in the neighbouring pixels, it smooths the edges out. If you zoom in on an image without anti-aliasing, you get edges like this. However, with it on, the same edge would appear smoother and less obviously digital. Samples is probably the second most important setting, after resolution, and it's critical to how Keyshot works. If I were a photographer, my camera would capture light rays coming from the environment and bouncing off the object I was taking a photo of. And these rays can come from anywhere. Keyshot, though, is rendering software that uses ray tracing technology, meaning that the same happens in reverse. Simulated rays are sent from the camera to every pixel on the image, and then are bounced in random directions to intercept light sources or other objects in the environment. The number of samples controls how many rays are created per pixel in the image, and more samples means that the image picks up more light sources and is more accurate to real life. Of course, this also increases render time. The difference when using samples is most obvious when rendering rough surfaces. With this comparison, you can see how the image with two samples per pixel looks dirty, because some samples are picking up only dark areas of the environment, and others only light areas. With increased samples comes greater accuracy, but look at the difference between 16 and 32 samples. The second image took twice as long to render, but was it really worth the additional time? These are the questions you need to ask yourself before you start the render process. Following on from that, we have ray bounces, which tells us the number of times one of our samples will reflect off materials before it stops being calculated. If you need to render something with glass or transparent plastic, or an environment with mirrors, you might want to increase ray bounces. Ray bounces having a setting of zero will mean everything in the scene appears completely black, as the samples don't bounce at all, and therefore can't reach a light source. For example, here we have a model of a duel between two mirrors. Watch the behaviour of the reflection of each mirror and the reflection of the duel. When I increase the number of ray bounces, the number of possible reflections increases and the duel itself actually becomes more realistic, with fewer black specks in it. We have time for one more setting, and I'll cover the least obvious one. DOF, which stands for Depth of Field. That's a setting that anyone who's into photography might be familiar with. It creates an artistic blurring effect to give the feeling of distance or closeness to a camera, and only objects within a certain distance from the camera will appear in focus with Depth of Field active. The DOF slider in Render Options controls quality of the blurring, as you can see here, but the camera controls can only be demonstrated with a live preview. Focus distance means the distance from the camera that will appear actually sharp and in focus, and it's controlled in the Camera Options in the Project tab. You can also manually set it by using the Select Focal Point command, and selecting a surface in the environment, like this. However, this blur is a bit too extreme, so I'll increase f-stop, or in physical terms, the camera aperture size, which makes the in-focus zone larger. These have to be set before you render the image. Now for a demonstration of the entire render process. I'll be rendering an assembly that everyone should have access to, this 
ball valve assembly, which can be found installed with solid edge. So let's create a render for it. As we know by now, we need tools, keyshot render. And here's a project I saved earlier. And because I know I used the same assembly to generate this render, that's what I'll use. Let's start by adding some materials to make this look a bit better. Brushed brass for these flanges, I think. You'll notice I don't need to add materials to every part if there's more than one occurrence in the assembly. Then we'll add some rough aluminium for this valve housing. Now these bolts have multiple face stars applied to them because they are considered threaded in solid edge. This appears as a different material in Keyshot, so let's replace this green colour. If I had a thread material available with the appropriate map applied, I would use it, but I don't. Not yet. I quite like the idea of having a walnut handle on this valve, and then steel for some of the rest of the assembly. As you can probably tell, you can spend ages making the perfect material. I won't do that today. Now for a step a lot of people miss. CAD models often have sharp edges, which look wrong in a photo render. My advice would be to select all scene geometry, and then add rounded edges to the entire model. The radius applied to your sharp edges is in metres, not millimetres, so be careful to add a few zeros onto the radius value here. Otherwise, the results aren't pretty. Now the question is, do we want to use environments or backplate images for the background? If we want to use depth of field, I recommend backplate images. If we keep that turned off, then environments will work fine. Let's add an environment, and let's say that the valve assembly is in a light tint. Now the ambient light looks much softer. I can always tweak the settings in the environment settings right here, and let's increase the brightness. However, let's say I also want a physical spotlight, but I didn't model one in Solid Edge. That's no problem, I just need to use the Edit Add Geometry button. Let's use a rounded cube, and I'll drag it up just above the valve. Here should be fine. Now I'll assign a light material. Maybe a cool light. Maybe something a bit more like a spotlight. That might be overkill, so let's dial down that intensity a bit. Well, that's well and good, but I'm not convinced by this environment. I've decided I want to show this assembly on a concrete floor. However, it looks like this environment, right here, was designed for a slightly bigger assembly. The size is, well, completely wrong. Let's decrease the size. Maybe not that much. If you take one thing from this video, just try not to be as clumsy as me. Now I've got the environment about right. So I'll save and rename this camera, but I won't lock it yet. Why? Because I want to show you what happens when you use depth of field and an environment instead of a backplate image. Okay, depth of field set to this point. No matter how high I put f-stop, the environment's still going to be blurry. Backplate images, though, are just flat pictures, so they aren't affected by depth of field. On the other hand, I want to keep my 3D environment, so I'll turn off depth of field. Instead, I'll tweak the camera focal length to give a bit more perspective. Actually, I think I want to bring this light from my spotlight even further down, and make it less orange. But that's just editing a material. You've seen this already, so I'll skip to the last part of this demo. I've realised something about my render. The handle on the ball valve is in the wrong position. It should really be in the 45 degree half open position. Now do I really need to remake this render as a result? Well, the answer is no. I still have solid edge open with the assembly used to create this render geometry. So let's alt tab back over to it. I reconstrained this assembly so that the handle can move. So let's use the drag command and drag it to about there. I don't really mind where it goes, I'm only after a render. Now back to tools, and instead of using Keyshot Render, I'll use Keyshot Update. Now bear in mind that Keyshot has to be open for this to work, but in this case it is. There we go, it's reset the position. 
but I made a mistake there. I didn't save my camera, so I'll need to do a little bit of rework. Now I should reorient the texture with the material tab, but we've already seen that. And it's going to take a minute to rebrowse for the diffuse texture, and then edit to the right angle value. At the moment it doesn't even have a texture feeding into the diffuse map, only the bump map. So we don't really have time to show this. But I'll set up some other render settings, and show you the results. I'll keep default resolution, and then go to Options. 32 samples should be more than enough. And then we'll add some pixel blur, some anti-aliasing, 4 should do just fine. Shadow quality can go to 4 as well, and while I don't have any translucent objects, ray bounces can go to 8 as well. Let's see what that does. Now that's the sort of image these settings will create. As you can see, it's a huge improvement on screenshots. The tools I've quickly shown you will give you a huge degree of control over how the image appears. I'm almost finished with this, but I'll leave you with some tips and common mistakes. These are just from my own experience on a support help desk, so I believe they should help all of you Solid Edge users watching this video. The first is that Solid Edge used to be able to do this without Keyshot. And the answer is, well, sort of. Solid Edge has advanced view settings, but as you can probably tell, they're not as good as Keyshot's. I've got the same valve assembly open with all my view override settings maxed out. And it looks okay. I can even add a background image if I want to, like this. Nothing but blue skies. So, can you make things look better with Solid Edge alone? Yes. Will they look as good as Keyshot renders? Not really. The next is, changing resolution changes print size. How do I stop it from doing that? And the answer is that, well, resolution and print size are linked by another setting, DPI, or dots per inch. Image size equals resolution divided by DPI. So if you don't change the DPI, then changing resolution will always change image size, and vice versa. DPI should really stay constant though, as it's a physical limit imposed by whatever printer you're going to be using. Finally, certain users found that their renders have faceted curved edges after exporting from Solid Edge. I have an example here. All my renders have these horrible faceted edges where a circular edge should appear. Just look at this. I've tried creating higher resolution renders, maxing my settings, but no result. My solid edge model has nice curved edges on the same bolt, so what's the problem? The problem is not with Keyshot. It was a setting in solid edge. Before hitting Keyshot render, I should have gone into my Keyshot options right here. Here's the problem, my output quality isn't very high. Personally, I prefer the quality that's one click to the right, like this. Now it doesn't update the Keyshot model, even if I hit Update, because the geometry has already been exported with that quality. But if I discard the project and make another render from Solid Edge, with better quality, and I'll look at the same bolt, maybe with some material aside, you can probably tell already that it's got a nice smooth circular edge, exactly what I want from my render. In summary then, Keyshot allows you to export much higher quality images than Solid Edge on its own can achieve. I've shown the basic rendering workflow, which is import, add materials, set up lights, position cameras, and then render. The step-by-step -step demo we had should be useful as a starting point for anyone new to Keyshot, however you should be able to experiment on your own afterwards. There are quite a few tools I didn't explain, but for very basic renders, you should know what you need to know. Finally, I showed three questions other users have had for us, and how to resolve the problems they had. Thanks very much for watching, and if you have any questions, different areas of Solid Edge you'd like to see covered in future videos or other feedback, please either leave a comment below or send them to us by email at support at cuttingedge.co.uk. And be sure to tune in to watch the next episode of Edgecast, in which I'll be explaining how variables can be used in Solid Edge to automate your part and assembly updates.